This morning, TDRS picked up an automated navigation beacon broadcasting at two minute intervals in Neptune orbit. Neptune orbit. This is incredible. It's the event horizon. She's come back. Welcome to the latest episode of the podcast that wouldn't die. I'm your host, Kevin. With me, as always, is Aaron. Hello. This week, we've got a very, very special episode. Our friends from the Science Fiction Remnant podcast are with us. We have Robert, we have Ray, and we have Gio. How's it going, guys? Hey, how's it going? Thank you uh, for inviting us. Of course, of course. This week, we're discussing the horror science fiction classic, Event Horizon, starring Lawrence Fishburne, Sam Neill, Kathleen Quinlan, Jason Isaacs. There's, it's literally an all-star cast. Um, each week on the podcast, The Wouldn't Die, we discuss guilty pleasures and forgotten classics of the horror and sci-fi genre with a comedic twist, hopefully. Aaron! <laughs> Aaron, what's the latest with you? I watched Brian's song yesterday. <laughs> I had never seen it before, and I was just flipping around the dial, and it was on. Okay, Brian's song is Billy D. Williams, James Caan, mm-hmm. and it is a made-for-TV movie about the yes. Chicago Bears? Yes. Okay, there you go. Good times. I had never seen it before because football, so... <laughs> American I mean, it was football. Fine. It was fine. Listeners. I can see how it might be emotional. Well, spoiler alert, right? He, it's a true story. Well... It came out in the 70s, so... It's I older mean, than me. Yeah, it's older than me. I, I mean, you want me to spoil Game of Thrones too? Because at this point, <laughs> it's your responsibility to see it. I like the anime. <laughs> <laughs> but James Caan was so young. So was Billy D. Williams. So it's like, wow. So now, Absolutely. scratched off the list. There you go. So why did you watch it? Because... It was, it was on? the show that was on after the show I had watched, and I just didn't get off the couch. <laughs> there's, there's no flipping channels. <laughs> yeah, we have remote controls these days. This shouldn't hey, happen, I, Aaron. I got to use one of those TVs that you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, when I was a kid, I was the remote control. My father would say, get up, change your channel. No, not to the kid's <laughs> channel. <laughs> <laughs> when I went to college... I got a, a VCR from a friend, and it was a top loader, which was old oh, yeah. even at that time. Oh, and yeah. the remote control it was a long cord. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you ever tried to clean cord. one of those suckers, the top loaders? Oh, it was terrible. It's the worst. And, and to make it matters worse is it didn't work, so I had to get it repaired. So I spent more <laughs> getting it repaired than if I would have just bought a brand new VCR. So. Oh, wow. Life lessons. <laughs> Sweet Lord. Uh, so, anywho. I got replaced by one of them. <laughs> Aaron, give us your 30 second synopsis of Event Horizon. Clive Barker wanted to do his own version of Alien and somehow incorporate the Cenobites. The end. <laughs> None of that is true. But okay, <laughs> it's got. I want it, it to be true. <laughs> it seems like it is, right? It yeah. seems like it could be. Uh, there's definitely kind of a, a pinhead kind of equivalent character in this. No racer, right? Yeah. I mean, you knew Sam Neill was bad from the beginning. I mean, it's also every every movie where they bring in an outsider who's the expert you know they're either a cyborg or just psycho yep yeah look it up we have the mad scientist <laughs> see what happens i'll tell you hey, i'm on the other side of the planet i'm the only one that doesn't have a moral compass <laughs> is that the rule <laughs> <laughs> chaotic evil well, well, Sam Neill, he's a Kiwi. So there you go. Anybody from that part of the world, right? Southern Hemisphere bad? Is that it? Apparently. <laughs> well, and, and I have questions about this. I, I hate to disappoint you, but we are no longer a prison colony, all right? That was a war. <laughs> Our grandparents came from the UK via Australia 
to then to California eventually. So you know what? Oh, that I'm means. so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> is that true, Aaron? I never that heard that that's story. That's fact. That's fact. You're making up nonsense. <laughs> um, no, it's true. <laughs> now, here's a question: What do you guys remember the first time you saw Event Horizon? Robert, do you remember? Uh, vaguely, it was a long, long time ago. <laughs> Oh, was man, it in the theater? Um, I, I think so. Um, only because <laughs> only because I couldn't get away. <laughs> so, you were <laughs> typically if I would be at home. I just turned the thing off, right? <laughs> um, when he's out at the cinema and that happens, he turns himself off. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm sure knowing how Robert used to be as a youngster. This will be one of those movies he would take a girlfriend so she could be all scared all over him. Oh, I'm scared. Oh, my God. You you know me so yes. well. And five minutes in, he'd be clinging to her. <laughs> this does not seem around. a date movie that, to that's me. That's the funny thing. Only no, if you want to put pathetic. your date to sleep. Oh. <laughs> Shots oh, fired. Oh. Oh, it's a date movie, all right. He's butt puckered so hard after this movie that it looked like a date. <laughs> oh, lovely. Lovely. <laughs> Ray, do you remember when you saw this the first time? It was it was in the cinema, I'm pretty sure. Um, when uh, Alien came out I, in... Um, no, sorry, it was Aliens. When Aliens came out, I didn't get to see it in the cinema because I was a bit too young. Um but I would drive past the cinema. Well, well I wasn't driving because I was a teenager. But um, I, I, the car would be driving past the cinema and you could hear the alien screeching outside the cinema. The, the, the volume was so high. Uh, and then um, I always regretted not seeing aliens in the cinema. And so when this came out, I went, oh, it looks a bit like aliens. I'm going to see that. So I made sure I saw it in the cinema. And, um, uh, yeah, it's just fantastic. Like, um, you know, in there with your friend joking around and this thing comes on, it's like, oh. <laughs> it's that I, kind of movie. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't as blase about horror back then as I am now, but um, yeah, it, it got to me a bit, I think. Oh, absolutely. Gio, I'm going to ask you. Is that because you hadn't seen actually Aliens at that point? Or? Oh, I'd seen, I'd seen Aliens by that time, but, you know, on home release. But I'd always regretted missing it. So like when the next big scary nasty spaceship horror movie thing came on. <laughs> uh, well, I'm actually the one with the most traumatic experience when it comes to this movie. I watched this movie like two years after it came out. So I was about eight or nine. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it was like, I remember Scarred it terrified me. As a kid. Yes, yes. <laughs> It actually, it actually helped to be to the becoming of the disaster I am. <laughs> but it was what I remember as a kid watching it is like it was so terrifying, but at the same time it was so captivating I could not stop watching because I wanted to know what was going to happen. And that was the birth of chaos. That's when chaos. And, and and it was like this. No, it's not not even that, man. It's like being on your bed and you know there's a monster underneath, but you still have to peek. <laughs> <laughs> I did not need to peek. I knew the monster was there. I didn't need the confirmation. I, I, I had this white cupboard that was up against the wall at the bottom of my bed. So it was the bed and then a space and then this cupboard. And because it was an old cupboard, the doors would warp slightly so they wouldn't close properly. And they would pop open in the middle of the night. They're going to snatch you off the Narnia. It didn't go to Narnia. It went to bloody deep space or something. (laughs) Aaron, do you remember when you, was this your first viewing? No, I saw, I think I saw this at the theater. And I, I, when you said we were going to watch this, I had a general disgruntled viewpoint. (laughs) And uh, watching it again, it all came back to me. The poster was beautiful. How could you be this beautiful? <laughs> it's, a beautiful it's like poster. buying wine based on the label. That does not work. <laughs> no matter how pretty the label is, right? That's I right. Mean, that is you're, not you're a better guarantee. Off, you're better off buying wine based on the price then. I saw this in the theater myself, actually. It was one of those things where I was just like, what's playing? There's this movie. I know nothing about it. And I rolled in there, but I don't think I've seen it since. In all what? honesty, I know. Yeah. What it's is been, wrong with you? 
<laughs> I was traumatized. Um, but I, I, I'm trying to think. This was this was late '90s, if I'm remembering correctly. Is that yeah. right? '97. Yeah. I was. I think I was 27 when I watched this film. Then I was 28. Because I'm a year older than you. So Kevin just confirmed to me that something is wrong with me because I've watched it more than 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> Every year at Christmas, just pop it in. <laughs> you, can, you can move in with me anytime you like, Gio. We'll just have a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just play it in the background somewhere in his house. <laughs> That's usually what I do. I always try to have like a, a, a movie playing on my third TV on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Uh, ADD man, I had to have like something just to like take me off if I am too bored or something, or to keep me on task. I either have music while I'm doing something, or I have my dirty videos with something on the or, uh, some movie playing, like a movie so, you can ignore. Yeah, yeah. I, I, can, I can ignore that. I like. I, I don't know if you guys have this, but I have like comfort TV, so like I have certain selection of movies and TV series that I just rewatch all the time. <coughs> Matrix. <laughs> Yep. A lot of the I rings. put Seinfeld on when I go to sleep. I set the sleep timer for 30 minutes and I put on Seinfeld. Nice. Oh, really? Nice. I don't, I I do don't even friends. have to look at it because I already I know to... what, what it's all about. I used to do that with friends <laughs> in the office. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why don't we jump right into the highlights? Uh, anybody want to start? Oh, yeah, I will. Go for it. So, um... It, it's like the, the it's like a haunted house versus um, the Mary Celeste in space kind mm -hmm. of deal, um, which always sort of interests me. You know, read the synopsis of the story. Oh, that sounds interesting. I gotta go see that. And um, that moment when they like they, they cruise along the side of the ship is like, what's going on in there? It's just sitting there. What the hell is happening? I need to know. And then they go and and get into that main corridor and, you know, you've got lightning from the um, uh, atmosphere of Neptune, f lightning flashing up and lighting it um, every now and again. And uh, it, it's like there's a poltergeist in there. All, the, all these bottles and spanners and things are floating around in there. And it, it's just it's just a fantastic sort of um, um, environ that they move into. It's like, this thing is creepy as shit. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not there. But you guys are fucked. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you notice the, docking, the, 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 the actual docking port they used? I mean, it starts with that. Mm. Port, I think, was 13. Of yes, course. it was. Good choice. Ooh, good call. <laughs> that was not a coincidence. Hey, hey don't, don't, don't say shit. Don't call that. it the it's my house call. number. My house number is 13. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we should probably talk briefly about what it's about. So a ship out in Neptune went missing in 2040, by the way, which is not that far from now. That we already have, like, ships. Uh, <laughs> so that was interesting. Uh, but it, it's reappeared. Right. So they're sending out like a salvage team to go find out what happened to the people. Right. So this is <laughs> this was interesting to me because literally it was like, what was it was like in 2023, we've mastered, you know, we've been to Mars or so. It was like right around oh, the corner. 2032, they're mining, mining in, in, on the lunar surface. Yes. Uh, 2040, that they launched the Horizon and 2047 is when they launched the rescue team. Right. Basically, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, future for us, has now actually occurred. She just read my mind. So basically what he's saying is Elon needs to get his shit together because he's got to keep to the timeline. Uh oh, 100%. I always <laughs> like those movies where it's like the near future becomes a little too near. You know what I mean? Or the past. Now, if you, or the if past! If you around long enough. Right. I hope, I hope that Blade Runner doesn't fail us uh, stay, in the, stay in canon with the real timeline. I'm, I'm still waiting for my flying cars and hoverboards from 2016. Really, like, seriously, get <laughs> on with it. No, I, lo I love, I love all those kind of the, the near future because it's like Alien Nation is like now 30 years ago. You know, if we're to believe, yep. and uh, was it Demolition Man is like right now. Yes. You know, <laughs> all that stuff's fascinating. Um, but this is like literally kind of a a bizarrely stacked cast. You know what I mean? It's like, now a lot of them were kind of uh, relatively unknown at the time, 
But we knew Sam Neill. This is after Jurassic Park. You Sam I mean? Neill had done everything. Uh, he, he was an you know, omen. He is immortal. There's He's a immortal. painting of him somewhere that's that that's just turned into a, a slushy monster because he's still around. He's still, he's still doing his thing. Absolutely, yeah. Lawrence Fishburne. We said. I mean, this this is kind of bizarrely stacked, in my opinion. What do you guys think? Well, agree, they all agree. thought they were in for a masterpiece. They're like, hey, yeah, look who's in. It was only two years after this that Lawrence Fishburne was in the Matrix. So yes. Yes, hundred yep. percent. And it's like, who else is in this? You got Lucius Malfoy from oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> the Harry <laughs> Potter movies. <laughs> Kathleen Quinlan had just been in, or was maybe a year later, was in Apollo thirteen, um, playing uh, Tom Hanks' wife. So she's she's doing stuff. I mean, it's <laughs> it worked out for them. It, it seemed <laughs> to work out all right. <laughs> Did, didn't quite work out for the studio though. It didn't make enough money. <laughs> No, I believe it. <laughs> well, this is funny because this is it, credited as Paul Anderson was the director of Event mm -hmm. Horizon. Not to be confused with Paul Thomas Anderson, who was making movies about the same time. Paul Anderson, actually, he went from Paul Anderson to Paul W.S. I, I saw that Anderson. very small. They made the W.S. micro so you could still be a little confused. Well, because they, they were like, well, you can't be Paul because there's already Paul Thomas. But with that WS, it kind of looks like Wes Anderson. And you can't be <laughs> that guy either. So that's why he's Paul WS Anderson. Um, prior to this, he had done like Mortal Kombat, I believe. <laughs> oi, oi, oi. <laughs> Which is a, a masterpiece of modern yep. cinema. I think we all agree. So, oh, yeah. that's I mean, I was into the video games year. back then. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, and then, and then and later he did like the Resident Evil movies. So this was kind of a little little heads this up. This was what a, we have his big overreach. Is that it? <laughs> and then he went directly to TV. Is that how it went? No, he's he's still doing stuff. I th I think. I mean, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> I kept confusing with Uwe Boll. He's not Uwe Boll. If that if that means anything, do you guys know who it Uwe does Boll not. is? It does. <laughs> Oh god, it does. He did. He was also famous for doing kind of video game movies, like he did yep. um, House of the Dead. And traditionally, his movie Uwe Boll's movies are horrendously awful. If you Google him, it's like he once uh, had a boxing match with his critics because they would just blast him constantly, and he got upset. So he's like, "I challenge anybody to a fight," and they did. <laughs> so that's a thing. Everything Another can be sold quality. by force, right? hundred <laughs> yeah, percent. They agreed with him after that, I guess. Um, now, here's a question: Why is Sam Neil already kind of possessed when he arrives? Do we know the answer to this? Well, he's really kind of just like a jackass, and then yeah, he's already flipping the switch. So maybe he had some knowledge when he set this thing up. That he knew that when he was opening the puzzle box, what was going to happen next? I, I, I think that he was messed up. Like, he just, um, he, he was traumatized. Like, most of them were actually traumatized. I mean, you don't get on a, a pissant little ship and go out to freaking Neptune if you're a sane human being. <laughs> exactly. Sure. If you have anything to live for. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So, I mean, the, the, the ship had lots of fodder to work with. To miss these people up. Sam Neill is, is a scientist who can't explain anything he does. I mean, I have a quote here. I can't explain it. It's math. <laughs> Aren't these people all at a certain level of education that they are oh, on the ship? I'm I not mean, so sure. <laughs> <laughs> I can't explain it. It's I, math. I, it's I math. mean, they agreed to go out there in the first place, so there's got to be a certain <laughs> level of do. <dirt. laughs> Yep, I, I I have I have my my own hypothesis about it. Please, uh, we, we do we did speak about it this on the episode we recorded about it. But basically, there is something that is having some kind of psychoactive effect on everybody in the crew. Could be airborne. I don't know. So basically, that's one of the most horrific things about this movie is that you're expecting based on what you've seen before on alien space horror movies 
there's gonna be something there hunting them but there is not a perpetrator the perpetrator is the crew itself having psychotic breaks and hurting each other and that makes it more more scary because you don't know when it's gonna kick in and who's gonna do what to who but it seems like sam neil woke up already exposed Whereas right. everybody else got exposed once they entered the ship. So, I, which makes me think he's already kind of knows what the hell's going on. I, I think yep. he, it started, uh, you know, my perspective on this is I think it started because he had a very big vested interest in the ship. Mm-hmm. Um, not only because this is something that he invented, uh, he's basically, this is its baby. Um, he, not, he, he doesn't know what happened to that ship for seven years. So as a scientist, he has that curiosity and seeing what happened. He is aware that they are using a black hole to go into a different dimension, but he wants to know, like every other scientist, you want to see, you want to measure it, you want to write it down. Um, And I think it started there, right? As to why you notice how he's hiding things from the crew. Mm-hmm. You know, we know, like, for example, there's a scene when everybody's asking everybody, you know, have you seen something? We just saw that he saw something like literally a few seconds ago and he's quiet. Now, with the late, uh, I forgot her name. She was saying that, yeah, I saw something. I saw my kid and there was things on their leg. That was Peter's, Peter's. Peter, yeah, Peter. And he's trying to shut her down. Right. Yeah. Yep. Poop yeah, only that. Not only that, I actually made a note about some other occurrence when Cooper brings Justin. Uh, yes. Basically, he totally disregards what Cooper is saying and starts to say, oh, you got in a security break. Uh, he's starting to give him some bullshit about decompression and the effects that it's having on you or the carbon monoxide. And the funny thing is that he's so blinded to go and find out and keep on the research at the cost of the crew Yeah. that they oversee completely how the hell Cooper knows what the drive the, the the drive does if he's never seen it and he has no scientific knowledge of it mm-hmm. so it's like when when cooper gave the, his testimony and he disproved it cooper really uh, there put him on spot that you know something is happening because how the hell do i know this thing does that you know right <laughs> if i haven't it, seen geo, it <laughs> geo it was kim trails and a weather balloon come on be serious <laughs> <laughs> fake news absolutely no well you wonder because he's the guy sam neil um weir is the guy who invented this drive so presumably he has you know tested it right so he's all perhaps i mean we're supposed to think he's already kind of opened up the doorway before he put it on the ship would be my guess right, right? because That's why i think he was already touched well, because so, before so he, he leaves the Pandora Box's bitch. <laughs> yeah. He was already a Cenobite. I mean, he was. He, was already, he is Pinhead. Boom. <laughs> yeah, I have to agree with you 100% because there's a scene that actually proves what you're talking about. Um, this kid, um, Baby Bear? <laughs> baby, baby Bear. bear. Yes, yeah, Baby Bear. bear. When, this, when the gravity drive um, activated, and we know that it gets activated when all the rings aligned, and then mm-hmm. that that m- liquid substance, uh, and he gets in and comes out. We could call it black goo. The black goo, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's Not already changed. With the alien prequels. Exactly. He's already changed. So that is uh, a full, you know, a full body connection to this thing. Now we rewind to when this machine was invented, there has to be some time during its testing where Dr. Weir was exposed to maybe a limited amount of this goo. Mm-hmm. And we already know what a goo does to a human right. being. So maybe he was affected at a level that wasn't very noticeable even to himself. And, right. and that, I don't know, that's my thought, my thought process in that. No, we don't know. The, the the screenplay doesn't tell us. But what we do know is before they leave, even leave Earth, he's already hallucinating. Right. He's already experiencing things. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, when he, when he gets onto the ship, it seems like he's now kind of the avatar for whatever is 
on the other side on some level. So what you're saying, you thought the opening credits he's post-psychotic break? 100%. (laughs) I really thought he was going to be some kind of a robot at first. You know, it's the HAL 9000. It is the weird, the real robot from the the first alien, you know? Right. Where we got to protect whatever it is at the cost of all the crew. Oh, he so he's bad, he was bad milk robot. But he was the bad milk robot. I'm like, why, why robots always have like white milk? You gotta have that milk. <laughs> the, the bad noodles? Yeah. <laughs> bad space noodles. Space noodles. Right, right. So, but let me ask you this. So Justin goes into the, first of all, they get on board the ship. They know some shit's wrong. And the first thing they say, we should all split up. Yes, you go to that yes. far end. Yeah, I'll go to this yes. end, and never the twain shall meet. That was not a good plan, in my humble opinion. I'm not a military tactician, but you know, my in my layman's opinion, bad idea. Well, let's send the entire crew over, also, except for like one dude. Yeah, great. <laughs> we I can mean, all agree that that was necessary for the plot. <laughs> <laughs> But the military see- personnel, when they go into a uh, in an unknown area, what do they do? They sweep, and they sweep together. Oh, right. Of course. So somebody's got to watch your back. Bangs. They totally should have had flashbangs. They would have been okay then. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so ju- now Justin gets sucked into the. Th- he puts his hand in. Another horrible idea. I'm just gonna Don't put touch my hand it. in. Don't Let's touch it. Let's see what it. happens. Bad idea. <laughs> He gets sucked in, but are we? He is possessed because he kind of snaps out of it later, and then they take him back with him. So I don't know what the story is with him. I, I, and I'm gonna, he was gone. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to answer that, but I'm going to I'm going to say something here to that Please. effect. Uh, I think this is where good films um, excel in it is whenever they give you something that puts it on you to figure out. Yes, yes. And only because this is why books are so successful. Because in a, in a book, they paint a scene for you. And, and you figure out in your head, you paint, you, you, you figure out in your, you visualize the scene in your head. And right. that's what a human brain does when he has not enough information. So it is, I think it's, it's epic in my opinion for someone to be able to do that in visual. Because, I mean, you're already visualizing because they're creating this for you. So it is very very hard, in my opinion, to create something visually that will still lack information for you to have to figure out what really happened. Right. And this happens throughout the entire film. This is just one example. Uh, I mean, we'll probably talk about this, but the ending was also another epic moment where, you know, they give you enough information and now you... Uh, 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 as the audience has to figure out, you know, what really happened? What was, what was actually there? So yeah, Justin, I think I would have to agree that he was gone. And the person who came back wasn't technically there. Or if we take what they say um, about, you know, you know, hell is just a word. What's there is actually worse than that. If we take that to to uh, th- that word to, to pass the Bible, then he was already way too traumatized to be. Yet he is the person that he was, but he's not because of the experiences he had after he went through the goo. Because I mean, that's a good question. Because there's there's like I'm changed because I have experienced trauma, right? Like PTSD. I I get that. But you also have to wonder, does he also have a little bit of the goo inside of him now? Well, because he basically tries to get him to all die. He tries to get him to open the airlock. So he is being manipulated. Yes. 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 What, what, what was he doing? He, he, I thought he was trying to commit suicide because of what he saw and he experienced. Well, so, he was also trying to get him. It looked like that. But then he also tried to get him to open it up, which would have been the end. Yes. And to expand on that, to me, when he came back, he didn't really came back. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want to put in psychological terms what happened to him, I think that he was the exception of the whole crew. While everybody was having psychotic breaks and episodes, he was in a fugue state of mind. Right. So he was in complete shot, unresponsive. And when he was moving, 
to go into the airlock, it felt more like he was being marionetted with his emotions. Yeah. Because he yeah. first looked like vacant of emotion. Mm. And once the airlock was going to open, he switched up to save me. And it was yeah. like so mechanical that you can, te- you can tell that's not him. That's whatever is influencing trying to get us all killed. It's like all those vampire movies where all of a sudden they snap back. Remember me? Yes. I yes. love you. And then you come up and they give you the bite. Yep. <laughs> yep. My my theory on the whole thing is that um, the, sh- the ship was possessed, basically. Right. There was an evil entity possessing the ship. Yeah, they said it was like an organism. Yeah. Now, the, the evil entity possessing the ship, it probably had minions or it could just start taking people over. But it had to break them first, and mm. we was pretty much broken from the start. It, it right, maybe that he'd been broken during the testing phases of the ship, yeah, uh, and they got to him already, uh, and and it may have been that because he was so far away from that um, malevolent entity that it wasn't affecting him too badly. He was just like a guy with PTSD because his wife committed suicide. But once he got back on the ship, it went like, oh, hi, nice to see you again. <laughs> Open the door, walk into his head, take over. <laughs> but the rest of them had to be broken first. They had to break break in. And when it took um, Baby Bear into the other space, it had its way with him and it spat him back out again. And now he was a minion. And it was able to take him over at any time, force him to do things, and then let him come back and enjoy the results. <laughs> um, so that was basically what it was doing. It was toying with uh, what was left of their minds after it had broken. So this is, this is another question. I think question. they were just trying to get it to turn on each other because they are the threat. So yep. like with the other crew, it was just getting them to wipe each other out. Yeah. See, I, I kind of looked at it as, I don't think it was, you should all kill each other. I think that was just kind of a byproduct of their crazy, psychosexual, cannibal. Like, this is like what they're into in that dimension. Just And I guess if you, I, I was reading behind the scenes, they're like, if what you saw in those kind of flashbacks were kind of weird, like they were having sex, but they were also killing each other while they're doing it. Like they were kind of in, like that's what they're into in this dimension. (laughs) With a lot of tentacle business. Well, those are guts or whatever. So, so that's the the question is, are they hallucinating? Like when Lawrence Fishburne sing the burning man, is that just a hallucination or is there actually a physical manifestation? I know later Sam Neill's now there as a physical manifestation. Is it a premonition? Well, that's a question. Like what were they actually there or was it just a hallucination messing with them i don't well, know I mean, all your experience of reality is a bunch of uh, electrical impulses that have been collected from your your um various sensory organs and then mm-hmm. it's just buzzing around inside your head so i mean if you if you can get inside someone's head and mess with those electrical impulses you can basically create anything yes uh, and it will f- seem real but it doesn't matter if it is or not. It just it's real for you because right. your, your brain's telling you it is. But um, it doesn't matter if it's there or not. I mean, it, it feels real. manipulated because oh, I yeah. the one lady who sees their child is lured into the pit where she falls through to die. Yes. right. That wasn't like just foreplay or anything. Like they were all going to get it on later on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you not see, only that. Not not only that, but like the scene where Miller sees he, uh, the crew member that that from previous missions right. years be- before that he had never told anybody, and the ship knew it. That's the 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 no turning point where the movie tells you that it's something getting in everybody's head. It's yeah, not right. an entity that walks and talks, which makes it the more scarier. The fire. Well, at the, by the end of the movie, the fire, I think it was real because the whole the whole room was on fire afterwards, which makes it creepy because uh, basically Weir went off a window. So I don't know how he made it back. So I will <laughs> venture to guess that being a black hole, if we bring into account the multiverse, 
it could be another version of him that came through that, that through the drive that mm. still lives and is conditioned to live in that inferno. <laughs> About that dead. scene, why do they have a harpoon? No, that was for, it was a tool. Because <laughs> when they were repairing the Lewis and Clark had a big like gash in the side of it. They were like using like it was a nail gun, essentially. It was like a revolver. It, it like nail had gun. a hook it, and they shot it out. It was a space stapler. That's a 100%. Stapler. <laughs> it was, it was a giant needle together. and thread to sew the ship yeah. back together. There you go. It's a space it, I mean, stapler. <laughs> and adding on to that question, when the airlock door is opening, as it's about to open, Justin's like veins are all bubbling and oh my God. Later, oh. when the window breaks open, you don't see anybody else bubbling and <laughs> they were totally you like, can, you can hear okay. his screams. You can hear his screams. He wasn't happy about it. That's true. <laughs> but, it wasn't, but he wasn't bubbling. Can bubble. he scream? Oh, that sounds unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a big issue with that with that scene. I always uh, laugh it's at that it's very, very unrealistic uh, when he <laughs> went into a space. I mean, not not even that. I mean, I actually timed it. It took from the moment that the doors open to right. the moment that Justin came back in the ship. It was twenty one seconds. That's a long time. <laughs> and he he was screaming, so he had air on his lungs, which well, makes his living condition more dire by the second. He shouldn't have been alive by two, three seconds. Well, here's the thing. There has been research that if you are exposed to the vacuum of space for 15 seconds, you lose consciousness. So how was he screaming past that mark? <laughs> well, there would be nothing in his lungs to scream with. Exactly. But right. They that... told him to expel all the air from his lungs. Oh, so he was screaming yeah. for it. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead and close and your eyes real it, hard. And then it's hard when it went past. And your eyes won't do that in space. You Doesn't know? immediately go. No. What about in Total Recall? What are you right. talking about? Total That's recall. what I'm basing all my science on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just good science. It's just an excuse to explode people. That's all it is. I don't be sneaking in outer space. Your, your eyes and everything, you should just burn really quick. Because it's no gravity. So you burn in, in the lack of temperature at all yeah uh, boy. total regal i think it happens like that but would it be because of the atmosphere is high on hydrogen in mars no that, that's because you know uh, effects you know for to make it sensational for the movie <laughs> <laughs> what it would not happen that way i don't you know oh, man. okay i'm gonna take off my helmet in mars then. <laughs> <laughs> when next time there's around. only one way to, t to find out <laughs> you, will, you will definitely die but not like that no <laughs> I just don't see how your eyes go back from that. <laughs> his deflate. eyes were giant. His tongue was hanging out. And then he's fine. He snapped yeah, right out of it. it all shrunk down. His vision improved. You know, it was all good after that. <laughs> Cohagen did not return from that. He's still yeah. flopping around a, out there. A bit too late. <laughs> it was a bit too late. Just a bit too late. Cohagen <laughs> out. <laughs> I thought he would like the the atmosphere would come in and then he'd be forced to live as a crazy mutant or something. Oh, uh, <laughs> that would have been really cool with the, with the twin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hundred percent. Good grief. Um, now we're supposed to think because I know at one point, like an early draft of the script, had like actual like aliens were were doing all this shit, and they decided to kind of veer away. They wanted it to be kind of the shining in space is yes. what they were going for. So it's kind of a, we're supposed to think it's like an extra dimensional entity of some sort that's causing the madness. Yeah. The collective. It's the Borg. It's 100%. the Borg. I wish it was the Borg. The Borg. <laughs> well, they, they actually state in the wiki that uh, the um, screenwriters were um, taking cues from Warhammer 40K, which has an right. extra dimension oh. called the warp. My where... son marched through the living room and announced that while Cha I was watching where, this. Where chaos <laughs> lives, basically. Or chaotic, chaotic creatures and, and entities and stuff. And yeah, basically. I kind of like really that. It lines up. I kind of like that thought because, you know, if, if, if you read a lot about, you know, scientifically about the multiverse, right. there is a 
um, it, it, there is a universe for a different variation of you. So it is not far-fetched to imagine that there is a universe where is the polar opposite, where everything is chaos and everything is hell. Like it, is. Other... <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> chaos. <laughs> That's chaos right there. Raspberry <laughs> Coca Cola. It, it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I, I kind of like that. Um, you know, I had a th I had a question because Please. every time that I mention this movie to someone that has never seen it, um, they tell me how horrendous this film is. And, <laughs> now, got no idea. now let me let me explain. Let me let me define it better. Uh, I don't mean horrendous as a bad movie. As I say horrendous as a horror movie. Like this, this is just straight out horror. Um, I guess I should have seen this film as that uh, because I typically don't like horror. Um, yet, I don't know how to explain why I like this film. However, um, this movie could have been worse, a lot worse. It could have been a musical. <laughs> <laughs> Because... Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. <laughs> oh, <I love that. laughs> uh, they they remove what was it, uh, Ray? I think it was 130 minutes off of oh, it. No no no. No, 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 it wasn't that much. No, no, no. Uh, the original length was 130 minutes, but they had uh -huh. to cut it down. Uh, and I think the final, I can't remember how much, but it was a big chunk yeah, because. There when was 10 minutes of freaky shit that they had to cut out. Right. I, I just More of the Cenobite world drifting yeah. over. Uh, yeah. They probably removed some scenes they... from the hellish orgy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That is, that is exactly what they did. And that, that footage has been lost. Um, unfortunately, there, there was... It, There's it, no it, director's it, cut? It, no, there oh, isn't. Man. Uh, it's, it's turned into um, uh, one of those sort of... Um, Oh, urban myths right. about what happened to the footage, but apparently it was found in a salt mine in Czechoslovakia or something. What like the bizarre. hell? The, the the actual reels and in and, a Nazi well, bunker. Well, no. <laughs> but apparently, salt mines are a great place to store unused footage, like like celluloid, because it doesn't break down because the air is so dry. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why they store celluloid in in salt rooms, uh, and and apparently they found this, but it was it was actually deteriorated. It wasn't good enough to um, to recover, uh, and there was apparently a VHS copy of it going around, um, which is you know another urban legend. But um, what, what I think it was you can actually faces of death. Of Followed by the director's cut of mm. Event Horizon. Yeah. I mean, Event Horizon what, snuff what, edition. <laughs> yes, <laughs> basically. But, but what, what um, Paul W.S., i got to put, include that bit in there, Anderson, um, uh, did was he hired um, porn actors yep. and amputees <laughs> to star in that scene. You see flashes of them. But um, basically, uh, he hired, hired people who looked disturbing and did disturbing things, and I uh, got them to do the scene for him to make it look more realistic. So, you know, he was on top of it. They, yeah. they screened it, and people were fainting. Yeah, that it was just so <laughs> it was so violent and so upsetting that the executives were like, "You are out of. We're not releasing it like this." Nope. So that so you get that kind of staccato kind of little moments where you're like, oh, something scary, something bad is happening there, and they had to cut out. Also, I think it was um, Jason Isaacs where he's kind of up in like the stirrups. Yes. Oh, that was the hooks or whatever. Art. Like that. that was art. That was oh, art. Yeah. And you can see like cuts <laughs> on the table below. The initial yeah. cut still had them kind of quasi attached, like kind like of Silence of the Labs or yeah. Hannibal. Yes, like, yes, that's what I was thinking. 100%. Yes. I, 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 right I have now. to admit, I'm one of those people who has frame by frame certain parts of this movie <laughs> trying to work out what the f*** is going on. 
<laughs> so the question that I had and where I was leading to all this is like I don't I don't typically like horror. Right. Do you feel that this is fine as is as a horror movie, or do you think this film could have benefited from those lost footage? Uh, we don't know. I, I I will say this: that would you know I'm not a huge Rob Zombie kind of guy. I'm not a huge Eli Roth kind of horror. Um, traditionally, I like kind of fun. Or, and I understand that, you know, that's kind of a nebulous term. I just think if it's too violent and too upsetting, it kind of sucks the fun out for me. Okay. Um, and the people who were suffering for it. <laughs> right. 100%. 100%. <laughs> so it, it, it just, you know, it, it totally is in the eye of the beholder, obviously. Um, my thing, my biggest complaint about some of this movie is I felt like some of the like spacewalk sequences oh my god that was like from uh, universal studios i freaking hate those things right. i cannot walk i have to have somebody hold my hand while i close my eyes because naturally my whole body wants to just go and fall off the side of that well, that was not, so I'm shitty i'm not even talking about that i'm talking oh, right. sorry. <laughs> i thought that was kind of interesting i'm talking about where it's uh, uh, Lawrence Fishburne is like, Justin, I'll be right there. And is just kind of floating along. It looked very cartoony, like it was Johnny Quest or something. Uh, <laughs> not my cup of tea. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would have got, taken another pass at those effects. Um, <laughs> and the Funhouse walkway. So evidently that was an issue, though, that Funhouse walkway. They would like, there was a scene where Lawrence Fishburne's supposed to run through there. And he couldn't. Because no. it was so disorienting. So, anyway, I, I think I think that the gravity felt a lot felt to my my view when I was watching it when there was no gravity and things would actually just fall into the floor, <laughs> <laughs> crash. Yeah, that was a big fail. You know, I I I you know you touch it right in the in the nail right there because that towards the beginning of the film when they are arriving and, and you know they're having that sh violent. You know, the, the, the Lewis and Clark is violently shaking and stuff like that. I'm thinking like, you know, they obviously have gravity plating like Star Trek, right? Why are you turning it on at a critical moment like that? Because you see things rattling, things falling to the floor. And I am assuming they turned it on because I'm giving them the benefit of, of the doubt because their things are falling. So obviously something is turned on. It, it, it just bugs me. Every time I watch it, even today, I watch, and I watch this film a lot, every time. When that moment comes in at the beginning of the film, it always bugs me. It's like, right. you know, why, why you is know? the activation of gravity plating digital and not analog? I mean, why wouldn't you just turn it up slowly and have the things just sort of gently float down? Why yeah, would you, you just don't go, know what's up there? Maybe one G. You get, you get nothing. You get nothing or one G. There's nothing in between. <laughs> <laughs> this is digital, right. dude. No <laughs> analog here. <laughs> Totally. Good, that is a good point. That you probably shouldn't have everything just smashing through the floor. <laughs> but but I mean, I think... you imagine that takes energy, right? So they're in a critical moment. They need energy. Turn that thing off. You can use that energy for something else. No, right. let's turn the gravity on. <laughs> but, but you know, Robert, it, it is part of the main ingredients for a horror in space like Alien is what Ray says. It's stupid people in space. Right. <laughs> oh, you just described Promethium. <laughs> <laughs> I it's read somewhere a, that, that we haven't done that movie. There, there are scenes. I liked where, Prometheus. I like to do. I think you need to go and see your psychologist. <laughs> now the problem problem with Prometheus and frankly all of like Damon Lindelof stuff is it's like they nobody knows the answers. You know what I mean? It's like I don't mind going to a thing where it's like it's a mystery and we're not spoon feeding it to you and maybe there's some things we don't explain. But I like to think that the film creators know what it all means. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and sometimes with Lind Lindelhoff, he's just like, I don't know. There's some slime over here. Who knows what that means? <laughs> don't looks, touch I think it. you're describing the end of Game of Thrones where it was like... <laughs> Shrug emoji. Shrug. We did it. We, we, we're tired of this. Let's just end it. They just kill <laughs> off like one of the, some of the main characters and wrap it up. 
<laughs> Wrap yeah, it well, up. She's crazy. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> both, both Robert and I are writers. I don't know about you guys, but um, when, when you're writing and you're not sure what's going to happen in a scene and you want to get over to another scene that you do know what's going to happen, that they, they advise you, just write, some stuff happens here and keep going. Right. <laughs> and I suspected in the script that that was in a couple of places and they mm. never got back to it. <laughs> Well, no, Lindelof was like, because you remember he did Lost in that first season. They're like, I don't know, some polar bears are there. You know, <laughs> it's like, who knows? Because he, he said like, well, it's kind of arrogant if you plan like a five season arc. You know, it's better just to just throw a bunch of crap out there and cross your fingers, I guess. So, anywho. It's like- arrogant to have an arc and know what the hell you <laughs> to were plan doing ahead. To Just plan ahead head is arrogant because your show could be canceled at any time. I'm so going to try to use that at work. It. You're arrogant. You're I arrogant. don't plan ahead. I take this moment by moment, this whole educational process. Make sure I find your organizational skills arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that right, I noticed like, that I thought was hilarious is when they arrive, there's like gore or whatever near the windows, like yes. skeletons. And yet there's no scene of anybody going like, I'm going to go take a look at this. Or clean it up or something, right? We're just like, oh, that's interesting. Moving on. I couldn't figure out if people just exploded and that's where it dried on the wall. Or is this some kind of organism growing on the wall? Yeah. But nobody seemed to give a shit. So <laughs> now, what, everybody's like, whatever. What was Not the, even what, because it was uh, one some... floating body. Not even the floating body that smashed up in the, main, in the deck. Nothing, nothing. What, what, what it was, was it was just a poor decorating choice, you know. <laughs> ten years have gone by. We're trying the, to forget that. It's like the, flares. Which is the the they use is like, oh, there's some blood. <laughs> yes. some guy who just sprayed out on the floor. I, 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 ex- I expect in the design for the scene, they said bad things have happened here. And just right. lifted it back. And just like <laughs> no shit. Well, and it's also <laughs> and, and everybody's like don't look at the wall. Just don't look at the wall. It was a bad design choice. We're trying to forget about it. I mean, they flipped the heat back on. They just had a guy powdered out. So this place is going to be stinking. Get the dust pan and a broom or something. Do me a favor. Or, or a wet and dry vacuum cleaner. I think that would be, it's, that it's, would be better. It's funny that you mentioned that because every time that body just falls and, and shatters in pieces, I, I, I was like, hurry, hurry, pick it up. before Please. It <laughs> Good get the broom get them up <laughs> I also appreciated that they designed the special gravity drive to look really evil you know like spikes and things it's like does it have to look like this I guess if it's the, the puzzle box from uh, Hellraiser right? it's That's like the Simpsons for. there was a switch at the bottom for evil. evil and they, they decided to flip the evil switch and, and how you get the food grinder <laughs> You, no, you mentioned you mentioned Warhammer forty K and that makes a lot of sense because you have that vibe of like the gothic. Ancient, uh, uh, yeah. It, it has that kind of vibe like Warhammer forty K. I never did that connection to be honest. And that's really? a great comparison actually. It's, it's very much like that. Hundred percent. Um do you guys have any other highlights you want to discuss? Well, apparently, after they turned the gravity back on and, and there was all the falling and shattering, they had snow cones for dinner that night. <laughs> but they cut that scene out. <laughs> Thankfully. That the was red right. snow, the, the red snow cone. <laughs> the red <laughs> snow cone. And how come there's no freaking fire suppression on this goddamn ship? Yeah. There is. You open the door. <laughs> you just flush it out. Just flush it. <laughs> Well, oh, I always, I always, on fire, click. You open the door and hold on. <laughs> yeah. Whenever yeah. I see movies like this, I always wonder: Do like self-destruct mechanisms truly exist in the world? Do people really say like, "Hey, if shit goes bad, hit this button and blow it up"? Or is that just a science fiction kind of trope? Well, I saw a meme the other day that had a doorbell connected to uh, an explosive on the wall. <laughs> Well, then, there you go. You then. mean like, did did the space shuttle have it? Yes. Does, does the giant fist in space have a self destruct button? All of the rockets, like like the, um, uh, all of the manned rockets, had a destruct button. Oh, okay. So well, there you go. Things, if things went pear shaped. You push this button, the crew capsule would eject. 
In fact, that little spiky thing right at the top of Saturn V is actually a parachute system. For I thought you were going to say it's like a dart, and that's where it would just stick. <laughs> no, but, uh, maybe. <laughs> moon, like that? Yeah. That, no, exactly. that's not what it was. <laughs> it's, it's actually it's actually a parachute system uh the the capsule would would be like uh explosively jettisoned off the top of the the rocket right. and and then it would open with parachutes and it would float down the big problem was that the ejection system they don't they never actually had to use it but they suspect <laughs> depending on how the rocket explodes if it explodes uh you can find lots of videos on youtube about amazing rocket explosions right and all of them have one thing in common. They're really f***ing quick. Yeah. <laughs> and they didn't, think, they didn't think that the ejection system would work fast enough to get the right. capsule out of the explosion range. Yeah, I mean, out the of shock, the way. The shock wave from the explosion might have given it a bit of a boost, but, you know, getting overcome by an explosion and, and sort of not making it is, is you, you know, uh, regular fodder on sci-fi shows. So, I, I assume uh, it's so expensive. It's not something they actually practice using. No. <laughs> it's more of a, hope yeah. it works. <laughs> Does my Prius just, have it? I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, exactly. just like the, the, the explosive bolts on the, the canopies of jet fighters. You just got to hope that they work. Because if they don't work and then you get ejected, it's like. <laughs> yeah. Squish. But there has been yep. some accidents when the, the, the door doesn't open fast enough before the ejection system it, works. It's worse on a helicopter, dude. Just yeah. shot right into it. <laughs> well, the ejection system on a helicopter, first thing that happens is the rotor blades are blown off. That's and a good then plan. you eject, but if it's not done in that order, it's bad. Uh, uh, you had a bad day. So. Yeah, no, you, just get a, you just get a haircut, man. <laughs> Every hair gets cut. Yeah. <laughs> All the way down to your toes. <laughs> Let's go behind the scenes, shall we? Let's. You really want to do that? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not <laughs> with you. Yeah, there's tell a us lot. more about the orgy, Kevin. There's, there's a lot. I mean, there's literally. I could tell you things that they uh, that they cut out. There's a, there's a I ton of it. I think that orgy scene probably was recorded in some place in Amsterdam, in one of those uh, uh, <laughs> it, was, same places. it was definitely Amsterdam. It was a dungeon. <laughs> it was either that or Florida. No, but there was... Dungeon, that was a dungeon <laughs> swingers club, probably. <laughs> it, was either co- either, it was either recorded there or California upstairs law school. <laughs> Ref- 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 <laughs> um, let me see what we got here. No, th- there was like... There were scenes of people having sex and then biting into somebody. There was a scene of somebody getting their legs smashed with clubs. Somebody getting sodomized with like a steel pole. Somebody like a group of people getting... doing the choo choo train. <laughs> yes, they were, they were doing the limbo. Yeah. Um, what didn't they borrow a scene from Human Centipede or something? Oh, <laughs> one one could only hope. The rotational shot of the space station over Earth that occurs five minutes into the movie took nearly a third of the film's visual effects budget. That oh seems God. wise. <laughs> Buddy well spent. You've got, to, you've got to open strong, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. When a director, Paul W.S. Anderson, was working on the movie Soldier with Kurt Russell after this, Russell great said, movie. Great movie. where's the orgy? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Russell said, I signed up for the orgy. What the hell is this? I mean, yes. imagine after Todd wanting that trash planet for so long, he needed something, right? <laughs> it's not a good sci-fi flick unless there's an orgy. Come on. <laughs> Absolutely. Russell said, forget about what this movie's doing now. In 15 years time, this is going to be the movie you're glad you made. So there you go. Well, um, all right. Okay. If you win, if you win, again. I mean, I mean, to add to that, I think that this movie is influential in sci-fi as a genre, as a whole. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it built the career of most of the cast. Right. This was like this was like the beginnings for some of those movie stars that are great movie stars now, known all across Hollywood. You know. 
Yeah, the acting's not the issue, except maybe Sam Neill's, but... Oh, <laughs> <that's fire. laughs> uh, Paul W.S. Anderson's initial rough cut submitted to the MPAA received the Kiss of Death NC-17 rating initially. What is so, the Kiss of Death rating? That just means it's it's even worse than an R rating. So this is oh like borderline A lot of theaters won't, cut, won't show it. Yeah. Oh my That's why it's Only kissing Only borderline? Come on, they're porn <laughs> actors. What do you expect? <laughs> that is true. They cross well, the to border. Be honest, to be honest, the way, like, how gore horror has gotten today, it yes. is vanilla. That's vanilla now. Oh, 100%. <laughs> it, does, it, it does scary to just like think about it, rationalize it. Like That was scary and, and strong, and now that's just vanilla. It was yes. just like quick shots, and that's it. Like I had to actually pause. Like, what's going on here? Just pause it like three times to like be able to catch a scene and see what's going on. <laughs> uh, let me see. So, Galaxy Quest. The screenwriter Robert Gordon, who was amused enough by the notion of the meat grinder tunnel in this movie, he added his own meat grinder uh, tunnel to Galaxy with Quest. With flames. With flames. Yep. They added flames as well. We've covered um, uh, Galaxy Quest on uh, Science Fiction. Love Station Galaxy Wind Quest. It's, it's amazing. It's a great movie. Great movie. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, the scene where Weir explains how to bend space and time in order to travel huge interstellar distances is paraphrased in the movie Interstellar in 2014. And they use the exact same demonstration to illustrate the theory by folding the piece of paper and pushing a pen through it. Yep. So that's colleges are going to get annoyed if they keep funny. wasting paper like that. That's right. <laughs> it's bad hey, for the they environment. Made, they messed up a perfect poster, man. They messed it up. <laughs> he but, was but very upset I, about that. <laughs> oh, I, I, and I get it. I get it. But but I think that... I like it was February. <laughs> <laughs> I think across the years, this is one of the best practical visual explanations to a concept I ever seen in my life, to be honest. Yeah, yeah the warp... Uh, it's the yeah, wormhole yeah. travel. Depending on how accurate that demonstration is, I think there's a lot of photocopiers that could send you to another dimension. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Clive Barker, whose movie Hellraiser was a huge influence on this film, consulted on the project during (laughs) production. He was consulted? Yes. Thank you, Aaron. Right again. You're right again. (laughs) Uh, the Event Horizon, which was the ship that they are rescuing, theoretically, was named after the theoretical boundary surrounding a black hole, within which yep. gravitational attraction is so great that nothing, not even radiation, can escape because the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. Boom. Good yep. to know. <laughs> let's, uh, let's look at the cast and crew, shall we? Uh, let's see. Director Paul W.S. Anderson. We talked about him ever so briefly. You know him from Resident Evil Apocalypse, uh, Event Horizon, Mm -hmm. Death Race in 2008, and he was the producer of The Three Musketeers in 2011. Good stuff. He is currently married to uh, Mila Jovovich. Who was? He was like, was he? Omen 2. He was Damien. Was that Omen no, 3? We're talking about the director, Aaron. Oh, shit. I thought you were talking about... Uh, <laughs> I think you've entered the uh, event horizon. I'm slipping into the Twilight Zone. <laughs> uh, Lawrence Fishburne played Miller, the captain of the ship. You know him from The Matrix, playing Morpheus. The Matrix Reloaded. He was in Contagion in 2011 and Mystic River in 2003. It was in a movie that I like very much that he doesn't, it, not many people know it, called Assault in Precinct 13 too. Very oh yeah, the, the remake Great with movie. Ethan Hawke, yeah. right? Yes, yes. Uh, Sam Neill played Weir, the possessed creator of the uh, Gravity Drive. You know him yeah, from... The dinosaurs weren't enough for him, he had to go out in the space. He absolutely <laughs> did. You know him from Jurassic Park in 1993. Hunt for the Wilder People in 2016. What the f*** is that? What's the Wilder People? That's a good, that's Taika Waititi. Um, he was Easy. in Memoirs of an Invisible Man in 1992 with Chevy Chase. Oh, Lord. <laughs> he was in The Piano in 1993. And of course, he was in, uh, what was it? Damien the Omen 2. 
I, I would venture one. to say that he might be an Ethan Hawke uh, friend too, because he's also in a movie with Ethan Hawke. Uh, uh, oh my God, what was the name of the movie? Uh, oh, I'll remember it. <laughs> but but there's, uh, he has a movie with Ethan Hawke that I like very much. Uh, uh, Daybreakers. That they are like vampires. Daybreakers, and, yes. Yeah, he's vampires. also in that movie. He, he makes a great villain. I, I think that when uh, when an actor makes a villain and he earns the hate or the dislike of the public, he exceeded at his role. He's just oh, like King Joffrey. Like King Joffrey, one of the best deaths I ever seen on TV. No so. question. <laughs> that was beautiful. That was oh, yes. that, that was prime Game of Thrones. You're yes. like, what the f <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I felt the same way. Joy. <laughs> Kathleen Quinlan played Peters. Uh you know her from Apollo 13. She played Marilyn Lovell. I never uh, saw that. Oh, Okay. She was in Breakdown in 1997 with Kurt Russell. She played Patricia Keneally in The Doors in 1991. I did see that with Val Kilmer. Absolutely. She was in A Civil Action in 1998 with uh, John Travolta. And I remember her in um, The Twilight Zone, the movie. Oh, God. Yes. Way back when. <laughs> Absolutely. She was in that one where the kid wishes the kids to the cornfield or whatever when people piss him off. They did that remake. That That is, well, it's not as good as the original, but that is just so iconic. This is, tells is you that, how evil children are. Is that the Twilight Zone where the, the, near the end of it, the, the story about the guy who was on the, the overnight flight and there was the gremlin on the wind? Absolutely. That Absolutely. scared the shit out of me as a kid. I oh, I, yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't fly for another ten years. I was like, I'm not going oh, up God. there. I know what happens. <laughs> did you guys did you guys ever get to go into the ride of Universal Studio or the or the haunted house that you actually get to see like the Twilight Zone on it? Oh really? Oh yeah. I've been to Universal out. Studios in a thousand years. Oh, it's fun as hell. Like you, you, I don't know if you remember on the TV show on the intro, like, you have like a, like a screen like with fog and stuff coming out in and out you actually have a ride on a car that is doing that and you're watching that and then you get into like a place and it's another veteran it just drops poof. <laughs> twilight zone was the best Absolutely. not so Absolutely. much the movie but the series <laughs> uh jolie richardson played stark the executive officer the second in command you Chapel know celebrity her. crush <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she was in 100 episodes of nip tuck I love Ju Nip Tuck. Julia that was McNamara. a great show. Well, isn't she related through marriage to Carrie Fisher? No, that's that's a Jolie. Uh, what's her name? Jolie Fisher. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, she's related uh, by marriage to Liam Neeson. Uh, Boom. Yeah, her sister was married to Liam Neeson until she died of cancer. Natasha Richardson. Natasha Richardson. Liam Neeson uh, has been awarded like the worst father of 2012. <laughs> <laughs> those kids just keep getting lost and taken absolutely very negligent uh, she, she was also in the patriot in 2000 101 dalmatians in 1996 yes. and thanks for sharing in 12 uh, 2012 um anybody else you guys want to know about who did we know <laughs> There's other people. <laughs> There's, and all the rest. And all the rest. Let's look at the rating for Event Horizon. Currently on Rotten Tomatoes, Event Horizon is 34%. Oh, that's rude. Do you yeah. know what the audience gave it? 42. 61. What? Yeah. The audience seemed to like it much more than the critics. Uh, but I think that that's because it's like uh, it became a cold following movie. A I think you're right. I think a lot of these cr critics, I think, thought about it like when the movie first came out, and a lot of the fans are are much more recent, perhaps. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. the way it always is on Rotten Tomatoes. You want to see? It'd be nice if they could have a rating from when it was released. Yeah. If you look right. at at some movies that were really classics, but now looking back people aren't that interested it'd be nice to know what they thought of it at the time yeah well, and apparently the it was you... a very it was a very crowded uh, movie season so there was a lot of other shows competing with it and i right. think that has a lot to do with you know if it was a quiet season it would get more attention because there was right. just more eyes on it but if 
it was a very busy season, there was other things that people were looking at. They weren't looking at this. Yeah. Well, I think they also, the, the studio was hoping for kind of like a science fiction adventure. And the director <laughs> gave, <laughs> gave him this, which is yeah. <laughs> something else. Let's just say that. So you Roger... guys going to get an adventure, but where you're going, it's not that fun. <laughs> Roger what you, Ebert. What do you mean the there's no return ticket? I want a return ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun Times says it's all style, climax, and special effects. The rules change with every scene. Two out of four stars. Boom. Uh, they don't. <laughs> how dare you, Roger Ebert? Uh, Peter Tatara from CNN.com says... No, it's Satara. Peter Satara, former bass player and lead singer of Chicago. Uh, he says, don't worry. It's not you. It really doesn't make any sense. <laughs> womp, womp. I, I, I'm sorry. The, this movie does not spoon feed you. Get over it. <laughs> maybe this movie was inspired from Hotel California, maybe. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> what go is... What is your rating, Aaron? I mean, it was so predictable. You knew Sam Neill was bad. It just felt felt like they wanted to make a space movie, and so they just borrowed from a bunch of pre-existing movies. I'm going to give it 2.5. I'm not part of this orgy at all out of, out of five what, what, what's, your top, what's your top number though I, I i gotta know what it's out of five okay, okay. Five. we're going for five right robert I mean, what do you it, think it's allowed to exist you well, know that's something <laughs> that's something robert what do you think i think because of his iconic uniqueness i want to give it a four holy shit Oh, you'll be surprised high. with you'll be surprised with raising my rating. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of those. So it's like up there with The Shining. Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't. You know, sadly enough, I haven't seen The Shining, but um, it, it, I think oh, it's come it's, on. You never seen oh, iconic what the uh, water <laughs> dams of blood? Iconic water dams of blood. You never seen that, man. Oh, <laughs> no, be sent to chaos. Okay, anyways. Here's Robert. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I think, and my reason for it is is very unique in its, in its use, not only of genre and how it's mixed, um, but how iconic it is as a sci-fi film. So that's why I give it that. Fair enough. Ray, what do you think? Uh, you're not going to agree with me, but I give it four and a half out of five. Boom! From okay. The first time I like I, I've been assaulted or something. It's yeah. like, <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> ratings, ratings are subjective, so you've got to like the genres, genre or genres, especially with a genre mixed movie like this. You've got to already like the genres. Sure, it had a lot of scenes that were reminiscent of um, other movies, uh, and. Um, and you might think, oh, yeah, I've, saw, I've seen this already. I've seen this already. But it, it's kind of like going to a restaurant and having a meal and going, oh, this reminds me of like 15 other meals, some of which I enjoyed and some which I didn't. But it's got its own unique mix, its own unique flavor. And the presentation is fantastic. And, you know, I, I part of me wants to dislike it and part of me can't help but be fascinated by it. And that's how I feel about this movie. Yeah. It the art near perfect. It, near perfect. It, it, it's art. It is art. And art is subjective, but it is art. I mean, from the design of the ship, which is very gothic. Um uh, I'm well. Obviously, you've invited science fiction remnant on the show, so obviously science fiction <laughs> is kind of our jam. Of course. Uh, and we, now, now and we, I'm not opposed to sci-fi. I once read The Martian Chronicles. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I I feel that you can pick on this movie for a whole bunch of things, but it pales in comparison once you look at it as a whole. And sure, 
you got to leave believability at the door for a few things, but the overall vibe, the the um, the, the the execution, the acting. I mean, all the characters are really well defined in the first ten minutes of the film. You get a feeling in that discussion before they leave what sort of people they are, and they're all immediately understandable you've got the creepy scientist you've got the captain who just wants to get everybody home because you know you find out later that he didn't previously right uh he and didn't this time know, either every, everybody's <laughs> got, that's right maybe shouldn't everybody's be a captain got, whoop <laughs> maybe space just sucks <laughs> <laughs> have you thought about that i believe that <laughs> i am not going on any of this shit <laughs> i'm staying here I mean, we, we have this section at the end of our podcast where we talk about the science and uh, just about every second show, especially if it's set in space, it's like, space is nasty. It does not like you. <laughs> it is 100%. not going to help you out. There's no warm no. fuzzies in space. It's either freezing cold or burning hot. No. Let's, Sorry. Let's, let's, let's Unless John right Luke is the captain, I'm not getting on the ship. <laughs> It's not that he doesn't like you. He just don't give a shit. <laughs> if he didn't like you, was one thing. He just kills you, not even trying. <laughs> well, well, in most space shows, I'd agree with you. In this one, it just doesn't like you. <laughs> so, yeah. But I mean, the links to 40k. I was, I've been a big 40k fan for a long time, so I, I really appreciated that. Um, and it's actually the fact that it doesn't spoon feed you. I like the mystery. I like the discussion afterwards, a movie that makes me think for three days, what the f was going on? I mean, I watched this movie and I need to go back and watch it again. Cause I'm still trying to work out what the f I go back and watch it again. I still don't know what's going on. Something was going on. It could have been this. It could have been that. It could have been that. I have like 16 theories. <laughs> you know, it's like which, you're describing a David Lynch film. hundred percent. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, you can you can you can pass over this very shallowly and go, ah, oh, yeah, it was sort of popcorn horror. There's a whole bunch of derivatives. I don't really give a shit. But if you really dig down into it and think about it, it's got a lot of meat. And it, I'm not just talking about that wall. I see what you did there. Don't don't look at the wall. Just keep talking. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I really appreciate the movie. It, it's sort of like, I, I score movies on mileage. Like, what did I get out of it? How much did I think about it? How many times did I want to go back and watch it for that particular scene, for that freeze frames, trying to work out what the hell they was doing? Um, you know, it it drew my attention. It had me thinking. And it's sci-fi, so I mean, it gets an extra star just for that. So um, all in all, yeah, I'm giving it high marks because it did a lot for me. Um, it, it may not be the Mona Lisa of, of movie making, but, um, it, you know, it was that, it was that street art that you're, you're on the train every morning going past and you're sort of like always looking for it because it always oh. grabs your attention and you're always trying to work out what the hell was the artist thinking when he drew, right. when he, like what, so this... which drug, which drug bought this bit on? Uh, so... so you can say <laughs> that like this movie is the, the Bansky of movies the, the banks <laughs> yeah that's what i was thinking <laughs> so yeah that's what i'm scoring it on uh, the attention that it drew from me which was considerate i mean i got up at 5 a.m on a sunday morning to talk to you about this movie does that say something yeah. <laughs> you spent a something. lot of time thinking about this it's <laughs> last sleep over this movie that's true <laughs> yes, yes, yes. geo what's your rating man well, I want to accompany Ray. We're gonna we're gonna gang up on you. It's four point five yeah. out of five. For sure. Yeah, but, and, and five. I you, yeah. <laughs> and I tell you my motives. There's a reason they call me chaos. I, I, I what like Ray mentioned. It, this movie does stimulate your mind in the most perverse way, and and I like that. And I have watched this movie like I tell you more than twenty times probably, uh, because of that. It, it does a good job, and it's one of those movies that is so full of details. Um, that you can watch it and rewatch it, you're always gonna get something new. Uh, another thing is that good sci fi, you're always gonna find reference to previous movies and shows and IPs. That it's you could, I don't know, sure if it will be plagiarism or maybe a tribute to right. other classics, you know. 
Uh, but yeah, that would be my rating. I, I really like this movie uh, on that sense. Uh, it's not a five because I think that if we would have made it on this day and era, uh, it could have been a five probably with more resources. The lack of resources probably was that thing. Okay, fair enough. Um, thinking about this, uh, I think I'm going to give it a 2.5. Um, I, I did not hate this movie. Did not hate it at all. I li- I thought the idea of kind of Hellraiser in space was kind of interesting. But honestly, and Aaron knows this, I'm not a huge Hellraiser fan either. How you dare know? you? I know. <laughs> she doesn't <laughs> like that. I, I find um, I'm not a big fan of kind of like, it's, we're doing gross bloody sex. Let's watch. <laughs> this is. Ah, like Saltburn with, with Bob or... Wire. With Bob Wire. Where did they get Bob Wire in outer space? <laughs> that, that's, and this is a question. I mean, obviously, it's, it's for the peak pin. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> not, not my cup of tea. It is really what it comes down to. I, I didn't hate it. I thought the performances were good. I thought the setting was interesting. Um, if I, but again, it's it's that thing where it's like I saw it in theaters and then I didn't see it again for thirty years or whatever it is. But when you guys suggested it, I was definitely interested in kind of giving it a revisit. So if you haven't seen it lately, I would say go ahead and check it out. But I, I was not that impressed. So such is life. Any last thoughts of Event Horizon? Well, I think so that it's, it's either uh, we don't really care for it or it is a master. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I think I think that if you didn't like it, the movie did its job because it terrified you. And if you went back and watched it, it did also its job because you liked it. Right? <laughs> that was very well done. <laughs> Somebody once told me it's like there are people who like Guns N' Roses and people who think they don't like it because they haven't listened to enough of it. <laughs> See, I wasn't going there. I wasn't going to tell you to watch it another six times, but I was thinking it. <laughs> so thank you very much go to our pages across social media we're on facebook we're on x blue sky threads instagram tiktok you may be watching this on youtube as we speak you can also email us the podcast that wouldn't die at gmail Gmail. we're on apple Podcasts, spotify anywhere the finer podcasts are available so don't forget to like share rate and review won't you Aaron, what is your social media situation? Uh, I'm on Artsy and First Dibs, Aaron Doherty, and I am the Cult of Aaron on Instagram. Join the cult. Beautiful. Now, where can people find your guys' amazing work? We're basically everywhere at Sci-Fi Remnant. Uh, We also have a website, sciencefictionremnant.com. And also, all you got to do is just Put in the hashtag, this is sci-fi, and you'll find us there too. Absolutely. Do yourself we, a favor and check it out. Go ahead. We haunt we haunt X occasionally too. <laughs> occasionally. Okay. Yeah. It's 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 kind of an event horizon situation over there at X these days. <laughs> you can't be sure if we're there or not. Always be looking over your shoulder. It's true. You don't know if, if like you're doing anything that makes a difference, and yet there's frightening images constantly assaulting you <laughs> while you're there yeah no yeah, question on X, no one X. can hear you scream <laughs> <laughs> depending on how much your lung capacity is maybe they can it's true wow. i'm about to put myself in the airlock frankly <laughs> um each week we like to do uh have uh comments and questions from people who listeners watchers from the internet so, discussing our episode of The Devil's Reign with William Shatner, uh, Emerico Salazar said this was the first movie I seen as a double feature when I was just a kid in the 70s. Boom. And didn't say whether he liked it or not. <laughs> just that he happened to see it as a double feature. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> Next wow, that's week. Like getting, that's like getting the biscuit without the dip, isn't it? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Next week, we're going to be discussing the new horror classic, Late Night with the Devil. And you can check that out on, on such things as Shudder, if you have a Shudder account. Uh, you can also watch it on AMC+. Plus, and it's actually still in theaters if you want to go have a theater experience. 
So check that out. You still have those? <laughs> Word on the street. So send us your favorite scenes, favorite quotes, comments, and questions, and we may talk about it on the show. So thank you very much. And thank you, Science Fiction Remnant, for joining us. Thanks for no, having thank us. You. Thank you no so worries. much for inviting us. Absolutely. And be well. Woohoo!